Good morning. Whoa. Is there anybody out there? Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Okay. Uh, I guess the verdict's out. Some people say without the beard I look younger. Now, someone just told me without the hair I look younger, but I don't know. With the hair, I don't know. So you have an opinion. You, uh, maybe you should have a, uh, you know, some sort of a poll or something and find out. Uh, you know, at any rate, um, all my friends now in my old church think I look like my dad. Um, some people think this makes me look like Caleb. But I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, um, we're going to go on, and um, that's enough for that for right now. But we're back in John, and we're going to go through John. I just, let me just explain a little bit as we, as we go through John um, how I pick sermons and so forth. Normally, um, I keep track of every sermon I've preached here but back 30 years ago, okay, on a little chart, you know, and so forth. And then I take a look, and um, we want to do the whole Word of God, and I don't want to miss anything. So I look at I've, sermons that I've preached more recently, books of the Bible that we've reached more recently. Um, we, we don't use those, and we go back to books that we've missed. And so John, I did practice back in, let's see, it was 1996 in evening services when I did, did the book of John, so I've never done it in the morning. So going back and repeating that particular book, not the same exact sermons, but repeating that book uh, 20, what, 20 years later, uh, is 23 years later, is, uh, isn't bad, you know? And um, if you've been here 30 years, you'll get the whole counsel of God as you go through the whole Bible. If you've just been here for five years, you know, uh, we don't want to get stuck on something. And in my uh, church in, and um, when I was in seminary, uh, they, spent, they spent three years, well, this is going to be a problem, maybe we'll see. A little loose. Let me see if I can just tighten up a little bit. See if that. Hold on a second. It's in there tight. Anything? Okay. We we spent like three years in the Book of Matthew. And, you know, if you spend three years in the book of Matthew, it's going to be a long time before you get to any other books. And so my basic goal is to spend like eight to 13 weeks on a series and then go have a break and then go on to something else. And so we've done John. We started John in the beginning of next week, and this is going to be a pain, isn't it? We started, I'm going to put it in my pocket and see if that changes anything. Are you now? Are the guys doing anything about there? We okay? They're working on it. Let me try that. Maybe it's the earpiece that's a little bit. So um, we just started John last week. Last year we did John uh, 1 to 10 in the beginning of the year. Now this is getting all loose. And 1 to, 1 to 10 in the beginning of the year. Then we went to um, the summer and we did the uh, family, and, uh, um, family and marriage sermon, uh, series. Then we went back into chapter 11 and 12. Did the summer, did the, um, did the uh, Christmas series on carols. Now we're going to go back and do John. We're going to finish up John um, right around Easter, a little bit after Easter, and then we'll have been through the book of John in three different sections like that. And so that's basically how we, how we handle it. Um, we've, we've, this particular passage today, John chapter 13, uh, actually, the, I have the wrong passage up there. It's 13, it should be say there, it should be say 13, uh, 20 to 30. Say, um, it should be 13, 20 to 36 is where we are today. Um, I could probably do 10 sermons on this. There's so much in here. But we're going to breeze through it. We're going to handle the whole thing because we try to do anywhere from 15 to 20 verses a week. Otherwise, you get bogged down in something and you're never going to get on to the next thing. So um, we're going to go through this passage today. And there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to be able to see that, uh, you know, might be helpful to you as we go on. And you can delve into later on your own. Um, Sean's up here, he's going to help me with the first service because what we're going to do is um, he's going to read the verses because we're going to go verse by verse and he'll read the verse so I don't have to read it and then we'll come back to uh, being able to uh, and I'll make a little bit of commentary on each verse as we go through it and some observations. But first of all, we're going to start off with a video like we've done before of this particular text with the whole text. So go ahead guys if you can and run the video and let's take a look at this particular passage, chapter 13, verses 20 to 36. talking about all of you. I know those I have chosen. But the scripture must come true that says the man who shared my food turned against me. I tell you this now before it happens. So that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. I am telling you the truth. Whoever receives anyone I send receives me also. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. After 
Jesus had said this, he was deeply troubled and declared openly, I am telling you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked at one another, completely puzzled about whom he meant. One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was sitting next to Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him. Ask him whom he is talking about. So that disciple moved closer to Jesus' side. Who is it, Lord? some bread in the sauce and give it to him. He is the man. So he took a piece of bread, dipped it, and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Hurry. And do what you must. None of the others at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas was in charge of the money bag, some of the disciples thought that Jesus had told him to go and buy what they needed for the festival, or to give something to the poor. Judas accepted the bread and went out at once. was night. After Judas had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man's glory is revealed. Now God's glory is revealed through him. And if God's glory is revealed through him, then God will reveal the glory of the Son of Man in himself. And he will do so at once. children. I shall not be with you very much longer. You will look for me, but I tell you now what I told the Jewish authorities. You cannot go where I am going. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Where are you going, Lord? You cannot follow me now where I am going. But later you will follow me. Lord, why can't I follow you now? I am ready to die for you. Are you really ready to die for me? I'm telling you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will say three times that you do not know me. Do not be worried and upset. Okay. I would have done a few things differently. I think as you heard of, as you talked to Pastor Rob last week, as you heard his sermon, um, it was really a, the, the tables they set out is not like the Michelangelo's pictures you took or even here. It's a low table, maybe this high and they would lean uh, on their left side and be eating with their right hand. So somebody would be sitting in front of here, so most likely John was right here to Jesus' right and leaning on him so that when Peter, wherever he is, we don't know where in the, on the table he is, when he um, motions over to John and says, please ask Jesus, all John has to do is go, Jesus, you know, and over his shoulder. They had a female here. To our knowledge, it was only the 12 disciples. We have no, I, uh, no mention of any woman being at this feast. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying the fact is this was an intimate thing with his 12 disciples, and so there weren't other people here. But you get a little bit of the idea. The other thing is they have the, um, the guards outside. Um, the reason that 
uh, there was so much, uh, you might say, cloak and dagger kind of stuff about where this would be held is because Jesus didn't want the guards or anybody else to know where this was. So even Judas did not know where this feast was going to be held. So consequently, there was no chance. Jesus didn't want any chance of him being betrayed while the uh, Last Supper is going on. He wants the, nobody to know, so, so Judas now um, can go, but the, by the time he gets everything arranged, um, he knows that he'll go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's where they meet. So Jesus has the uh, opportunity to talk to his own disciples. So let's go on through this uh, passage a little bit. I'll make a few comments as we go verse by verse. I'm going to ask uh, Sean to read the verse, and then I'll make a few comments, and we'll read the next one. And I'm going to go back to a verse that we actually took from that Pastor Rob had last week because it, it starts off this particular scenario, and it's verse 18. I do not speak of all of you. I know the one I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Okay, a couple things here. First of all, uh, it says th this comes from Psalm chapter 49, Psalm 49, verse uh, 41, verse 9. It's a quote, and it's talking, it's actually from a section where David's talking about his good friend Ahithophel. Okay, remember this Absalom uh, took over, and if you want to read the context, you can. In fact, you can go back to Psalm 55, where David goes a little bit further into this kind of a, um, into talking about this, where he talks about what has actually taken place, and it's uh, um, Absalom's taken over, Ahithophel is David's confidant, has been his confidant all along. But he decides to side with Absalom and give advice to Absalom. And so Ahithophel is one of David's closest emissaries, closest friends. And yet he ditches David, but Absalom asks him and goes, goes with Absalom. And so David is talking about the fact of someone who, uh, a close trusted friend who has left him. I don't know if you've ever had a close to trusted friend which has ditched you in some way, but that's what has happened for David, and that's the quote that is used here in this text when John's talking about uh, this particular situation. Whether, he, um, whether in David's situation he was only talking about himself or if there was a possible future fulfillment. Oftentimes prophecies in the Old Testament have two fulfillments, one near, going to take place right then, and then one in the future. And it appears that this is a future fulfillment of this particular passage, and uh, John uses this verse. Now it says, lifts up his heel. I don't know, there's a couple of things you can think of. You think of a donkey or a horse kicking, what do they do? <laughs> Lift up their heel, right? They're going to kick you. Um, sometimes in a race, uh, someone lifts up their heel to kind of, you know, kind of try to trip up the guy that's running next to him. Um, if you decide that you're going to walk away from me, what do you do? You turn, and I'm going to walk, what happens? My heel comes up, right? Because I'm walking away from you. Lifted up your heel, could be just decided to walk away. Judas decides to take a different path. Um, he's not going to go the same. And in other passages, uh, some things, maybe it means shake the dust off your feet. You know, you know I'm going to shake up my heel and shake the dust off my feet and go my own way. Whatever the, the, the scenario or the visual of it is, it's obvious that at this point, a close personal friend of Jesus Christ, one who has been with him for three and a half years, lived, eaten, a trusted person who wound up being the treasurer. I mean, you don't put a, a person that you don't trust in charge of all the money, do you? Who would you do? Would, you, would, anybody, would any of you give your money to a thief to take care of for you? No. But so they gave it to Judas. They didn't know think he was a fee, thief. Nobody knew that. This was a trusted individual. All the disciples, that tells us in Matthew 26, were looking at each other saying, should I, uh, is it I when he says someone's going to betray me? Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? In fact, it says, Judas asks, is it me also? You know, whether the other disciples are asking, it's like, you know, am I unintentionally going to, you know, betray you, Jesus? They really can't figure this out. But traitor is an ugly word. Uh, many of us, uh, if you know the history, you think of Benedict Arnold. I don't know if anybody, how many people know the story of Benedict Arnold, okay? Uh, you may know the name, but you may not know the whole story, but he tried to give over West Point to the British, and uh, he was a, his, the papers were that um, were going back in between the British and him were intercepted, and he wound up being found out. West Point did not go to the British during the Revolutionary War. We were able to keep it, but eventually, uh, in order to escape, he went over to the British and died in, in, uh, in exile over in Britain. Um, another, another one you might uh, remember if you're back in, uh, go back to school, is the play Julius Caesar, remember? And uh, Brutus, 
was uh, a close personal friend. And what, what was the word that uh, in the play they say? Julius Caesar says to Brutus, what is it? Yeah, there you go. A lot of people. Et tu, Brute, you also? Or even you, Brutus? My close personal friend? Betrayal hurts when it's someone close to us. In chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, just before this, we have the perfume incident where, um, where um, Mary puts the perfume over to pour the perfume of Jesus, and Judas says, why wasn't this sold? It was a, it's worth a year's salary? That could have gone into the treasury. And everybody thinks, oh, the disciples think, yeah, that's a, that's a good financial decision. <laughs> but he wanted it because of the money. That could have been his breaking point, maybe some, some suggest, of saying, I'm out of here. You know, if, we're, if I can't get that kind of thing, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to be a part of this. This is actually the third time Jesus Christ broaches this subject in the book of John of a traitor. He did it back in chapter 6, verses 67 and 70, and I've left room for you to write comments if you want to write comments on there and write some of these verses down in, in the notes. Um, but 60, 64 and 70 talks about it and then here again in verses 10 and 11 earlier in the section that uh, Pastor Rob read last week and preached last week he also talks about a betrayer and now once again in verse 18 and in verse 21 which we're going to go to next he talks about this betrayer so let's go to verse 21 and take a look at that when Jesus had said this he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Okay. So um, let's go to the next verse, guys. There you go. So Jesus is going to say that one of them has betrayed him. Um, this word, I think this is interesting. He talks about Judas, and then what automatically happens? He becomes troubled in the soul. Would you get upset if your closest, one of your closest associates was going to betray you? We're going to turn you in. All of a sudden, Jesus is troubled. This word is the same word that's used um, actually later on. We'll see it in the very next uh, sermon in chapter 14. Uh, Let you not your hearts be troubled, but it's because he's trying to contrast it with here. But it also is the same word that he uses at Lazarus' grave. When he goes to the uh, tomb and sees that Lazarus dead, his, his spirit is troubled. It really brings on a lot of deep grief for him. Next verse. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. So again, here we have, we have the indication that all the disciples are asking the same question. They're wondering, is this something unintentional I'm going to do? Is this something in the future I have no intention of doing? Or is this something that, uh, you know, is it me? And if we look at Matthew, Judas actually asks if, it, if it's him. And Jesus, and Jesus uh, says, uh, you have said it. He kind of uh, says to Judas, I know what you're going to do. John doesn't bring up that particular point, but all the, all the disciples are looking at each other. The other point here is that they don't all of them look over to Judas. You're the culprit. I know it's you. No, no, no. They don't know that it's Judas. They have no idea what it is. Next verse. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So who was the person? John. John, always, John never speaks of himself in the book of John by name. You will not find John's name. John talks about the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who loved Jesus, all kinds of terms and knowledge, but John never uses his own personal name in the book of John. We understand that he was the one that wrote it. I mean, it's uh, good, good support. Uh, he was in Ephesus, and a lot of people think that the first three synoptics were written early on, and then someone said, John, you were the loved, beloved disciple. You were so, this beloved disciple you were so close to Jesus, would you write your own account? And John writes this account different from the synoptics to give a theological perspective demonstrating that Jesus Christ is actually the Son of God. And so in this case, he, he, writes, these, he writes this passage, and he's the one that's leaning there. Now, um, the person that's reclining on Jesus' bosom is usually the one to his right. Remember they had a big argument about who's going to be on Christ's, uh, which side, the right side and left side in, the, in heaven? Well, the right side at a feast is very important. So if I'm leaning like this, the person that's right here that I can see and they can talk to me real easily, that's the place of honor. There are other places, and we don't know where Judas was. Did Judas, was Judas behind Jesus? How to give him the morsel? But he was close enough for Jesus to give him this morsel at that point. So let's go on um, to verse 24. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. 
again, so we know we don't have any idea where, where Peter was sitting. There have been many commentators trying to say he was sitting. He was sitting the person next to John, so it was Jesus and then John, so or it was Jesus, John, and Peter, so Peter would easily be able to say to John, who is it? But he couldn't really talk to Jesus real well. Um, but some say he was across the way, and he kind of looked over at him and you know, kind of, you know, made the thing, and John got the signal, you know, and knew that he was supposed to ask. Um, but he gestured to him, obviously, he, and said to him, so somehow he got his attention and said, tell him who it is of whom he's speaking. Tell us, t- let us find out. Next verse. He, leaning back, thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Okay, so it appears, as we look at the scripture here, that nobody else hears this. It's only John and Jesus. So he's not shouting it for everybody to hear. He leans back, kind of, and says, who is it, Jesus? You know, and the rest of them, they're talking, their conversation, whatever's happening during the typical meal. And it's just, this is a private thing between Judas and Jesus. Next. Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now, there's, there's various interpretations of what this morsel is, of what it, of, of what it means. Some say that, um, and if, if you noticed, in the, it was accurate in the place. It's, it's the, like, matzo bread and so forth. And there's a plate, if you've ever gone through a Seder, with uh, a mixture of apples and herbs and so forth on it. And that, I'm assuming, is what it was. He dips it, as typically he would, dips it in. And some say it's a uh, act of real honor to have the guest of honor dip it and give it to you personally. That's a real, a real sign of, of importance. And some think that that was Jesus' final overture to, jo- to Judas. Change your mind. You don't have to do this. Others think that maybe it was him saying, his secret way of saying to Judas, I know what you're going to do. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to dime you out, but I know, here it is. And kind of a, a connection between them two. We don't know what the, what the incident is, but that's what has taken place. And some point, uh, in 1 Peter 3, 9, it says, you know, uh, God is not willing that any p- should perish, but all should come to repentance. Uh, therefore, a thousand years is like a year, and a year is a thousand years. God's going to be slow uh, at coming, a second coming in Christ, because he wants everyone to come to him. And the thought is, perhaps he's giving Judas one last chance to change your mind. But you'll find that that's not the way it goes. The other thing I found interesting, this, and I just, it's, there's a couple of slides I just want to point out here. There was an interesting thing for you that, uh, as far as for, as for me, um, if you put up the next slide, um, it says he dipped the morsel. And one of the commentators pointed out, which I thought was interesting, that the word for dip was actually bapto, or baptize, that word that we say in the Bible, you transliterate. So when they come to talking about a person being baptized in the Bible, um, instead of translating it as immerse, they transliterated it as baptizo and then said, oh, that means whatever we're doing, you know, sprinkling or pouring, whatever. In this case, they didn't use the word baptizo, baptize. They didn't say he baptized the morsel. They said he dipped the morsel, okay? But dip and baptize are the same word. And so if you really want to go one further, you could actually say in the next slide, um, I'll immerse the morsel. He immersed it in the, the, in the uh, plate of sauce and then gave it to him. So it's the same word. It's just that the commentators, again, when the Anglican commentators, who at that point were practicing, um, you know, the sprinkling of infants and calling it baptism, they transliterated the words to kind of cover it up because King James would have chopped their head off if they'd done something wrong here. So to keep their kind of connections with the Catholic Church and so forth, they transliterated the word, but they didn't do it all the time. And in this case, they actually put the word dip in there, which is what it means, is what the word bapto or um, baptize means. So let's go on to the next verse. Let's read that, and we'll keep on moving on through here as we get to verse um, 26, or or 27 now. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Okay, so he gives him the morsel, and this is where some of them are saying, is this his last chance to change? You know, his last chance to say, I'm not going to do this. But when he does this, immediately Satan enters into him. Now, we all know about demon possession, okay? Satanic possession. Here, Satan enters into him, 
and finally he succumbs to what Satan wants him to do. Now, it's not like a demon possession where the demon takes control and throws him down violently or anything like that, as many of those demon possessions, but Satan is trying to attack him. And Satan, if you go back to the very beginning of Genesis, what is Satan's goal in all of the Old Testament? To keep what from happening? To keep Christ from going to the cross. That's the whole thing. He wants to, he, he, he tries to get um, Eve to sin. Now he's got her part of it, part of him. Then he tries to get the, uh, he tries to, uh, in Genesis 6, um, mutilate the line. Then he gets everybody to reject God, so God destroys the earth with the flood. I mean, we can go on and on and find the activities of Jesus, of Satan, trying to stop the, Messiah, the messianic line as you look through it, trying to taint Jews, trying to get rid of the Jews, trying to stop Jesus Christ from being born, trying to stop the, the cross from happening. And here is his last shot. Let me, let's see if we can get Jesus killed, then that would stop everything. He, I don't know why he never gets the fact that Jesus dying for sins would actually be his defeat. He thinks if he can get rid of Jesus, that's what takes place. That would be the, the prime. And so here at this point, we find him entering into Satan and uh, ascending, entering into him. And then Jesus says, what you do, do quickly. Now, how come? Does he just want to get it over with? I don't know. Um, this is my own personal opinion. And to be honest with you, I didn't read this in anybody's commentary, so um, maybe it's wrong, or just maybe I'm the first one to ever think this, <laughs> you know? But I'm thinking Jesus wanted him out of there. Jesus had done the foot washing, and it's interesting. He knew Judas was going to betray him, and yet he still served and washed his feet. We're going to be talking about a verse in a couple minutes when we get to 34 and 35, his discourse. And here's the person that's going to betray him, and he washes his feet along with all the others. He gives him the morsel. But now he wants to have a conversation with his, his, his disciples. He doesn't want any distractions. And so my thought is, he gives the morsel to him, and when Satan enters him, he says, Judas, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Now, he just wants him out of there, because he wants to have some private time with those who are his followers. Next verse. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. Again, not a single inclination that this guy is the betrayer. He said, someone's going to betray him. He said, go do quickly what you've got to do. They have no idea. In fact, read the next verse. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. I'm supposing that maybe as John's writing this, this after the hall, I mean, if something happens in your life, don't you go back and review it a lot of times? What went wrong? What, what did you think? Whatever happened here? I'm sure the disciples discussed this final night many, many times over. And I don't think some of them are saying, they're gossiping back and forth, always oh, going to do this or he's going to do that. I think maybe it's my supposition that after the fact, while the disciples are talking, John says, what did you guys think he was saying when he sent Judas out? I'm thinking, well, I thought he was going to get, tell him to go get some food for us. We, we were missing something, or I thought he was going to give the poor. The, they had all kinds of ideas. And these were two of them that John inserts into the scripture to let us know these guys had no idea that it was Judas. They thought he was just going out to do something good. Next. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. This kind of ends the section here, verse 30, of Judas's outing and a betrayal. What stands out to me are these last three words. It was what? Night. It was night. You know, when Judas decides to betray Jesus... It's a dark day. But it was night. It was night because it was the time when the, um, you know, it was after evening, and it was dark when he went outside, of course. So it was night. But I think he's talking about a lot more than just it was dark when he went outside. He meant it was night. There was a spiritual darkness. Here was the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And Judas decided to lift up his heel and walk away. It's a dark day if anyone in this congregation or any one of our friends comes to know the truth of Jesus Christ and then walks away. 
In Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about those that have been close to the light. They've been really close. And if, they've, if after being seeing the, the work of the Holy Spirit and being that close, they reject and walk away, they'll never come to repentance again. And uh, to me, the, the idea is kind of like Judas. I mean, who could get closer to Jesus than being one of his disciples for, tw- for, for three and a half years, you know? Who could get closer and yet still turn around and walk away? And as we know, there was no redemption for Judas. He eventually, as we'll find out, went out and hanged himself after doing the deed. So it was night, and this is a dark day for Judas. There's some lessons that, um, and these aren't my lessons, these are from, uh, from um, John MacArthur, and I wrote them in your thing. If you want to look at them, you have something just to write down. Um, Judas is a, a lesson in lost opportunity and wasted privilege. So close. Boy, people, a person that comes to church doesn't serve and walks away from Jesus Christ. What a waste. The second thing is the danger of loving money. He was a thief. He loved handling the money. And it's nice to have money. Guys, if you want to put that next one up, it's love to have, nice to have money, but when it, it starts affecting how you think and what you do, it's a problem. And that's what you, part of one of Jesus' problems was. Third thing, profession is not always the same as acceptance. Professing Jesus Christ, saying I'm one of his, doesn't mean you've really accepted him. The Bible talks about wheat and tares, about those that are fakes. And we hope there's no fakes here in the church, but we don't know. Judas was a fake, but nobody knew it. He professed. When Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, guess what? Judas went out with them. He was one of those two. I don't know who his partner was, but he went out. His profession was not the same as acceptance. So you can fool a lot of people, but we can't fool Jesus. Jesus knew. Third, fourth thing, the devil is always at work to lure us away. Don't think that because you're a Christian, the devil's going to leave you alone. He probably works hardest on the leaders of the church and on people in prominent positions and you, because when they fail, it makes the newspapers and everything else. I was always scared as a, as a chaplain, you know. I was always afraid I was going to do something wrong, you know. I mean, I tried to do the best I could, but, you know, if, if, if my... If my cuck V back in the day, <laughs> they don't have those now, or if my Humvee that I'm driving has an accident, guess what? The whole post is going to know it. The, if it happens, there are, le- there are probably less chaplains than there are probably less chaplains than our generals. You know, I mean, a general does it. Hey, who's going to say anything? A chaplain does. Oh, I can't believe the chaplain did. How idiot! <laughs> you know, uh, you, it just rises that, and Satan wants to see that. He's going to attack the people that are most obvious. If <laughs> The alternate to that is, if you're not doing anything for God, you probably don't have to worry about Satan attacking you very much because he doesn't care about you, you know? He's going to look for the person that's trying to do something for God that's important to the church, that's, that's important to his kingdom. That's the person he's going after. And lastly, man's sinfulness cannot thwart the will of God. Even when we do sinful things, it can fit into God's plan. Judas was fully responsible for what he did. It was not a dumb thing. He could have changed at any moment, but he didn't. He was responsible for what took place. He and himself alone. But it was used for God's glory eventually. Let's move on to the next section of the verses. This is God's, Jesus' command, and it's in 31 to 35. Let's read the first couple of verses. First of all, I call this a new commandment or the, 12, the 11th commandment. Um, there was a man that was, um, came to the uh, pastor, and he wanted to, uh, a handout often happens and he said uh, I, you know, I'm, I go to church this, they, they, a lot of them say this you know I go to church I'm, I just got stranded you know I know the Bible I've been you know I'm a Christian and I just I just I need some money and the pastor said well um, let me ask you a simple question how many, how many commandments are there and he said he said 11 ah, you're wrong <laughs> you don't go to church he said, sure I do he said well tell me what the 11th commandment is he said these verses verses 34 and 35 a new commandment I give you that you love one another Let's take a look at this brief, uh, briefly. First two verses here. Go ahead, Sean. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. I find it interesting. The last three verses, words of the last verse were what? It was, he says, Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus says, Now is the Son glorified. To me, it seems to relate there, you know. He goes out, Judas leaves. Now Jesus can be honest and talk to the rest of the disciples. 
Now he can have this conversation he's been looking forward to. And he says, I will be glorified. I'm just going to rattle these off. If you want to get them, you can look on the, uh, on the video later on and, and peel them down. But um, John MacArthur, these f- five points, and I thought it was great. I don't think you'll be able to write them down as I say them, but I'll, I'll write them, I'll say them anyway. Um, he was glorified in that he displayed God's power. It declared God's justice. We're talking about the cross now. It revealed God's holiness. It expressed God's faithfulness. And it demonstrated God's love. Once more, for the quick note takers, it displayed the cross, displayed God's power, declared God's justice, revealed God's holiness, expressed God's faithfulness, and demonstrated God's love. Verse 33. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. There's two things interesting about this. First of all, he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm not going to say a whole lot about that, but that'll come up in a couple seconds with Peter as we look at another verse here. And I want to focus on the word little children. Um, That's an endearing term, you know. Jesus looked at these guys while they were grown men. Joshua gets upset with me because I'll say, hey, kiddo. And he says, I'm not a kiddo. I'm a young man. Well, he's no longer a young man. Now he's a man, you know. So, uh, you know, but these old guys, Jesus talking to them, little children. And John uses that word. If you look at John, one of his signature words in 1 John, his epistle, is little children. He uses that phrase seven times in 1 John. As he talks to those that are following him, as he's an old man now, probably in his 90s, writing this particular passage. Little children, that's what we are to Jesus. We never grow up. We are always his little children. He's looking out for us. 34 and 35, and these are some of the most critical verses in the, in the uh, New Testament. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. These two verses could be preached on for five sermons. I'm going to try to do it in three minutes. The result of practicing this command to love one another is this others will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The result of practicing this new command is unbelievers will understand that you are my disciples. Do we read verse 35 also or just 34? 35 as well. Okay, put 35 up there just so you can see that. Here's the result. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Today in the world, they say, I don't want to come to the church because it's full of a bunch of what? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. That is the exact opposite of what Jesus Christ wants. In fact, Jesus Christ said, they have a right to judge us. They have a right to judge and look at you and you and you and you and you and you. And if you don't go along with somebody else in the church, if you don't get along with your Christian spouse, if you don't get along with some other believer, they have a right to judge you. I say, you're not even a Christian probably. Because they will know that we are Christians if we have love for one another. This command must be linked to forgiveness. You can't love if you can't forgive. A lot of times, and and this is a perfect example, we're going to read in just a couple of seconds, and we we won't spend much time here, but Jesus predicts that Peter's going to deny him in the end of this section and in the beginning of the section that Judas is going to betray him. And yet when Peter talks to him and says, how many times must I forgive my my brother? What does Jesus Christ say? Seventy times seven, continually. Matthew 6, 12 and Matthew uh, Matthew 6, 14 to 15 um, is the Lord's Prayer. What's it say? Forgive us our debts, What? as we forgive our debtors. And if you look at the the two verses, we never read these. The two verses following that prayer say this. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Paul nails it down a little bit more. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Listen to this carefully. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ 
has forgiven you. So if Christ has not forgiven you all of your sins, you have the privilege of racking up all the sins that other people have committed against you and saying, I'm not going to forgive them. I'm going to hold this grudge. But if Jesus Christ has forgiven you, it is your job to forgive everyone else. Whether they, it doesn't say whether they ask or not. It's your job to forgive. It's not based on if they ask forgiveness, if they apologize, if they change their ways. This is the mark of true Christianity. Let me read this um, quote from um, Francis Schaeffer, uh, an author from a long time ago. How many remember the name Francis Schaeffer? Anybody? Yeah, he's been gone for a long time now, for a while, but he wrote this. The church is to be a loving church in a dying culture. God gives the world the right to judge whether you and I are born-again Christians on the basis of our observable love toward all Christians. That's pretty frightening. Jesus turns to the world and says, I have something to say to you. On the basis of my authority, I give you a right. You may judge whether or not an individual is a Christian on the basis of the love he shows to all Christians. How are you doing on this new commandment? How are you doing? To your spouse. To your fellow believer in the church. To the believer who maybe falsely accuses you or becomes a traitor to you or has offended you. A new pastor preached the same sermon three weeks in a row. The elders finally said, we better call a meeting. A pastor, three weeks, the same exact sermon. Don't you, don't you have anything, uh, any other sermons? You know, I have lots of sermons. As soon as you apply the first one, I'll preach you another one. This sermon can be preached a hundred times because I don't know that we follow it. I don't know that we follow it. <laughs> I know people who have problems with bitterness. Is your heart hardened? Is it selfish? Is it disobedient to this command? Let's run through these last verses, 36 to 38. Peter's denial. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. This is a direct reference when Peter says, Why can't I follow you? to verse 33 we talked about it earlier. Okay? Um, and I'll come back again in next week's passage. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here except that Peter has a sense that Jesus means he's going to die. And he says, I'll die for you. And there's further, uh, there's further elaboration of synoptics in Matthew where it says all the other disciples were saying the exact same thing. So it wasn't just Peter. But John MacArthur, again, I like his commentary, his quote on this one. It says, sadly, good intentions in a secure room after good food are far less attractive than in a darkened garden with a hostile mob. Peter remains uncharacteristically silent through the rest of the Lord's farewell discourse. Perhaps he's thinking about what Jesus has just told him. We don't hear from him again. The passage starts with Judas, the prediction of Judas' betrayal. It ends the prediction of Peter's denial. And sandwiched in between are two rejections of, the two rejection, of those two rejections is the New Testament commandment about love and forgiveness. Jesus reached out to Judas one last time. He forgave Peter. What's your response to the close friend that rejects you? Love and forgiveness or rejection, distance, and a broken relationship? I haven't vi officiated it as many funerals as Pastor Scott has, but I can tell you the ones I've done, I've done a number for outside the church as well as inside the church. <laughs> I can't believe those where there is so much broken relationships in the family, fighting over the state, fighting over how it's going to be done, counseling soldiers overseas, and them having problems with their wives back home who aren't doing what they think they should be doing, or the wives not not trusting the soldiers or I mean it's just incredible the broken relationships that take place in this world it 
if anyone has been committed and believes that they have followed this command perfectly, you're better than me. Many of us need to think about this today. The theme is love one another as Jesus has loved you. Love one another as Jesus has loved you. So bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm not going to pray to close of the day this morning. I'm going to let you pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and as they come up, look at your own life. Pray to God. You know what you want to pray about this theme.